Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. With the cold weather that's hit Lethbridge, the city has activated its extreme temperature response plan to help those most vulnerable. The Canadian Tax Press Federation blasted the Trudeau Liberals, this time over the funding the federal government gave the CBC during the pandemic. And political commentator Brian Lilly has an update on the public inquiry into the Emergencies Act taking place in Ottawa. Your nation, your province, your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. In dealing with the cold and snowy weather here in Lethbridge, the city has activated its extreme temperature response plan to provide a safe and warm place for those who do not have shelter. That includes access to both the main branch of the public library and the crossings branch. City officials say the regional park and ride transit terminal can also offer a warm and safe place Monday through Friday. What we saw this week with the wind chills and well, the, the slam of winter that kind of abruptly came in the region, uh, we saw a need to potentially activate some uh, warming centers, which we refer to as comfort centers. So basically in the city, we'll open these centers uh, to provide uh, an ability for people to, to cool off or warm up in the, in the winter months, which we're using right now. Uh, in some cases, there might be light nourishments like coffee or the ability to charge devices, but really it's just giving people a break from the elements. We know that in past years, it's been a lot colder than usual. And of course, that takes a toll on our vulnerable population. The big one with what we saw this week was knowing that it's realistically the first major snow event of the year. People are going to be more vulnerable. So we wanted to be a little bit ahead of the punch. And we know it's only lasting two days, but at least these resources are available for people. Now, there are also other cold emergency supports for Lethbridge, which includes the Soup Kitchen, Streets Alive, the Alpha House, Woods Homes, and the YWCA Harbour House. More information on the warm and safe shelters can be found on the City of Lethbridge website or by calling 311. You know, our furry friends are also in need this time of year during the extreme cold temperatures. It's also National Animal Shelter Appreciation Week here in the city. Now with this cold snap, Community Animal Services in Lethbridge is currently operating dangerously close to capacity with both dogs and cats. Skylar Plourd, the director of the organization, says there are some tips you can implement to help keep your pooches safe and warm when you take them out into the frigid cold temperatures. Depending on the breed, they're all going to have um, different abilities to, to withstand uh, uh, different weather and climate. The base is that they all need to be provided with access to shelter um, and, and suitable and usable food and water, obviously. If you are out walking with the dog and you return home, it is a good idea to check the, the paws for you know ice buildup between the feet. People do use... Uh, different types of de-icer and some of them are not pet friendly. So wiping it with a towel uh, is, is, is helpful to keep the dog protected from those kind of things. Pluard added that making sure your pets have proper registration and microchipping them will reduce their time in shelters. Lethbridge Fire and Emergency Crews responded to a house fire in our city on Tuesday morning at around 8 o'clock. The house is located in the 1200 block of 4th Avenue North. Officials say the cause of the blaze is still under investigation and a damage estimate is being totaled as well. Crews remained on scene at the house fire for a few hours early into the afternoon. Well, it's been very cold here in southwestern Alberta, as you've seen. In fact, we may even get below minus 25 degrees overnight tonight. Jeanette Roche is in now with a quick peek at the forecast. Jeanette, fortunately, a warming trend may be on the way. It is hell, but not until later this week. So we're still going to have to brave through these frigid temperatures over the next couple of days. Now, you'd mentioned minus 25 overnight. And of course, what the wind chill is going to feel more like minus 33 and minus 34 by the morning with that wind chill. Wednesday, though, climbing up to a high of minus 17, but still with those wind chill factors throughout the day. And then after that, it looks like there is a warming trend on the way, as we mentioned before. And I will have all those details coming up for you later on the show. The Alberta government announced that more than $161 million will be invested to grow Alberta's hydrogen sector with funding from the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. Government officials say our province is the leading hydrogen producer and the funding will help to support a new $1.6 billion facility that's expected to create around 2,500 construction jobs, then 30 permanent jobs once it's operational. In a statement, Energy Minister Pete Guthrie says not only is the province creating new jobs, but also growing the energy sector and bringing clean hydrogen to customers across Western Canada. 
Now, when completed in late 2024, the facility is expected to produce more than 165 million standard cubic feet of hydrogen per day. Ontario Provincial Police Superintendent Dana Early says she briefly considered putting off an operation to clear a blockade of protesters at the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor. Early says she was worried that clearing the bridge might intensify the ongoing Freedom Convoy taking place in Ottawa. Her testimony is part of the inquiry into Ottawa's decision to use the Emergencies Act to remove demonstrators protesting COVID-19 restrictions. Protesters in Ottawa had already been entrenched for weeks by the time police were ready to move in to the Windsor-Detroit Ambassador Bridge. Political commentator Brian Lilly has been covering the public inquiry into the Emergencies Act quite extensively. And we asked Brian Lilly if he thought invoking the act by the Trudeau Liberals was even necessary. Well, I, so far, I'm going to go with the, the top police and intelligence officials who were saying, no, don't do this. CSIS told them this will radicalize people, and they still went ahead. The concern from CSIS wasn't that there would be violence right away, um, but that by invoking the act, people who are angry at government and decided that this protest was a, a good way of expressing that might turn around and then say, well, I have no other option now. I've got to turn to violence because if I protest, they just shut me down. Mr. Lilly will have more on the public inquiry into the Emergencies Act coming up later in our broadcast. Health ministers from across Canada are meeting in Vancouver to discuss the need to increase health care transfers. They'll also be meeting with our country's federal health minister, Jean-Yves Duclos. BC Minister of Health Adrian Dix says they're looking forward to a positive discussion following a year of radio silence from Ottawa. We need support from our federal partners. And today we reiterated our call on Canada's pre uh, of, of the Canada's premiers, led uh, by Premier Horgan, over much of the last year and now by Pre Premier Stephenson for a, new, for a renewed health care funding partnership with the federal government delivered through the Canada Health Transfer. The degree of unanimity and support for this over a period of months as we have waited for any federal response has been a source of strength, demonstrates the willingness to focus on what matters to people, which is the quality of care and the delivery of services, demonstrates, is demonstrated again today by our united and common approach to see a change in the Canada Health Transfer and an increase in the Canada Health Transfer such that we can meet the demands of the future. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation is criticizing the Trudeau government for giving the CBC more money in the fiscal update after the Canadian public broadcaster handed out millions upon millions of dollars in bonuses and raises since 2015. Now, to talk about this in more detail is the Alberta director of the CTF, Chris Sims, who joins us now from Lethbridge. Chris, what kind of numbers are we looking at when it comes to the bonuses and raises that CBC employees received, including during the pandemic? This has really been the tale of two pandemics. Uh, we quite often hear people say things like, uh, we're all in this together. Well, no, actually, we're not. We're all in the same storm. Some of us are in big fancy yachts that are taxpayer funded, and the rest of us are struggling in lifeboats. CBC is definitely in the former category. So we have seen $156 million paid out in raises and bonuses since 2015. So since Prime Minister Justin Trudeau took over power and during the pandemic. What that looks like is about $14,000 dollars per person uh, who got bonuses and uh, very similar comparable numbers for those who got raises. And again, we have to stress a lot of this is middle management type people uh, who were getting big bonuses, all while the rest of us were taking pay cuts and seeing our businesses shut down. Now, Chris, the CBC received more than $1.2 billion from taxpayers last year. That's a tough pill to swallow for many Canadians who lost their jobs or businesses or even took pay cuts during the pandemic. It really is. And it fluctuates between 1.2 billion, which is what it's at right now, and 1.4 billion, which is what it was last year. This is a staggering amount of money. And sometimes it's too big of a number. I did the math. We could pay 13,000 frontline nurses, registered nurses, every year. Brand new ones for what we pay for the CBC. And again, uh, you know, you and I worked together in journalism uh, years ago, and we've been in this game for a while. Their ratings are going down. Uh, very few people are watching the national. Very few people are turning into the CBC. But yet taxpayers are still paying through the nose for it and seeing insult to injury, bonuses during COVID. Thanks so much for your time, Chris. 
That was Chris Sims, Alberta Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from here in Lethbridge. Young Indigenous women are still disappearing and sadly many times are ending up dead. Not much is being done to address the issue. Now that's according to Reverend Deborah Minous, a pastor and a residential school survivor. In October, the body of 34-year-old Tia Blood was discovered just outside of Colehurst here in southwestern Alberta. Manu says missing and murdered Indigenous women is still a huge problem that needs national attention. I don't feel that there is enough that is being said, that is being done for our people, for the First Nations women and Indigenous women, because the fact is that many times they have gone missing and they're not even on the news. And I've seen where there's other nationalities of uh, women where instantly there is, uh, you know, uh, Amber Alert for uh, somebody that's under 18. It goes out immediately. And uh, this is not going on with our women. According to Stats Canada, nearly half of Indigenous women 15 years of age or older who were murdered between 2015 and 2020 were killed by an intimate partner. The issue of post-traumatic stress disorders plagued many veterans here in our community. A Southern Alberta organization called Care West Operational Stress Injury Clinic is providing some much-needed help for veterans who have experienced an operational stress injury. During the year, the clinic will average around 400 to 600 veteran clients. Stormy Marshall, the senior manager of the clinic, says they're entirely funded by Veterans Affairs Canada. He explains what exactly an operational stress injury really is. It's used to describe broad range of problems, uh, which include diagnosed medical conditions such as anxiety disorders, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD, as well as other conditions that may be less severe but still interfere with daily functioning. It comes from various experiences such as active combat, but there's other areas which can cause an OSI such as search and rescue operations, training accidents, and link casualties, and other situations which are prevalent within service. So these experiences then in interfere with a person's life, and that's termed an OSI. Marshall adds that there's currently no cost to veterans who want to access the clinic. A man who is well known here in southwestern Alberta for bringing a lot of talent to Lethbridge was honoured on Monday night. Ron Sakamoto received a special wall of honour at the NMAC Centre in our city. Sack's honorary wall highlights the impact Sakamoto's had on our city. It recognizes the contributions he's made to the community, along with the national and international accolades he's received in his career. Mayor Blaine Hicken called Sakamoto a true champion in our community and said that it was a well-deserved recognition to bestow upon him. The wall is located in the West Tower of the NMAC Centre, which has been the main hub of major events here in our city. Congratulations going out to Ron Sakamoto, so very well-deserved. A two-story family home was just built in Vancouver with a classic design and wooden cladding. Now what makes this home different, however, is that it is net zero certified and includes thick insulated walls, solar panels, and even a heat pump. Paul Lilly, the general manager of Kingdom Builders, explains. We're standing here in front of a home in the city of Vancouver on Point Grey Road that's a step five net zero home. Uh, we completed the home in uh, 2021. Uh, the interesting uh, features about this house is, one, it looks like a traditional house. There's nothing that would scream energy efficiency uh, at all. Um, and uh, in order to, to get to this step five uh, net zero, um, we basically have a home that's completely wrapped in insulation. And so underneath the home, we have uh, 12 inches of insulation under the entire uh, raft slab. There's no basement here. And that insulation uh, also runs up on the exterior of the building. We have a two by six wall and on the outside of the wall is uh, four inches of uh, mineral wool insulation. And that continues right up uh, over the top of the house uh, on the roof as well. Likewise, a very important feature with these homes is the air tightness. And we have a uh, continuous air barrier that's um, behind the insulation and it wraps right up uh, and over top of the roof as well. Uh, you'll also notice with the glazing on this house, there are fiberglass uh, windows from Cascadia, locally sourced, and it's uh, a passive certified um, doors and windows. Uh, and you'll notice uh, the heat pumps there as well. We have um, one for uh, a bit of uh, heating and cooling in the house, which is very minimal because of how energy efficient the home is. And then the other heat pump is a sand and uh, heat pump, which uh, produces the hot water for the home. So this is a fully electrified uh, build, uh, no gas whatsoever. 90% energy efficiency. Wow, that's incredible. You know, it's so important for Christians to always work together to further the kingdom of God. 
That's according to Pastor Gary Mason with the Medicine Hat Family Church. Pastor Gary says it's especially important for believers to come together in a corporate setting. The reality is, is that very word church, uh, it comes from an old Greek word called ecclesia. And the cle ecclesia was the called out and gathered together people. They were called out of their communities, out of their homes and everything, and they were gathered together for a purpose. And, and when we look at that, you know, it was specifically used by the Apostle Paul a lot of times to, to say, hey, we are called out. We need to come together for the purposes of the kingdom of God. And if we miss that, then we miss something in the middle of it all. So, so you know, I don't have to go to church. Mm. That's maybe the truth, but you're better off if you do. Make sure you catch the full interview with Pastor Gary Mason from the Medicine Hat Family Church and BCN's Jeanette Rocher coming up later in our broadcast. Well, it looks like the snow has stopped here in Lethbridge, but it appears as though the mercury will be plummeting before it finally warms up. Full weather details are on deck. You know, my mother used to say, son, embrace the snow and it'll embrace you back. Well, it's embraced me to the point of having a sore back from all of the shoveling I've been doing over the past couple of days. Fortunately, the snow has stopped and a warming trend is on the way. Jeanette Roche is in now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, we could be going above zero again fairly soon. Yes, and I'm looking forward to that. And also be careful shoveling, Hal. Hopefully you won't have to shovel too much longer because, uh, like you said, that warming trend is on its way. So hopefully some of the snow will disappear. It won't be quite so heavy. Although we are expecting a bit more snowfall come Saturday, but with warmer temperatures. So there you go. So yes, we are looking at uh, only a daytime high of minus 17 tomorrow with the wind chill going to feel more like minus 24 into Thursday. That's when we're going to see uh, temperatures start to get a little bit more seasonable. Uh, minus four is the high for Thursday. Lots of sunshine. And then we're going to jump up into the pluses. So we've got four degrees as the high on Friday. A nice zero degree temperature on Saturday with a 60% chance of flurries though. And then we're going to climb right up there to six degrees for both Sunday and Monday with lots of sunshine. So let's hope that those plus temperatures uh, help some of that snow to melt away fast. Average high for this time of year is six degrees. Average low minus 622 was our high temperature on this day back in 2004. And in 1945, look at that, it was a frigid minus 26. 7.32 is when the sun rose this morning, sunset this evening. I should say this afternoon, 4.59 p.m. Look at that, already in the 4 o'clock hour. Thanks to that clock moving back, now it's suddenly getting so much darker, so much earlier, giving us 9 hours and 27 minutes of daylight today. 6 degrees on the coast tomorrow in Victoria, sunshine, 4 degrees in Vancouver. Vancouver also looking at some wind chill in the morning, minus 8, uh, minus 16 the high in Edmonton. Same thing for Calgary tomorrow, but nice sunny skies and, of course, much chillier with that wind chill. My Minus 15 the high tomorrow in Saskatoon, but beautiful sunshine, mainly clear skies in Regina, a bit of cloud coverage there, minus 13 the high there. One degree the high in Winnipeg and also looking at a chance of a flurries there, some periods of light snow. As we look to the central part of the country, 11 degrees the high with lots of sunshine, clear skies also expected in Ottawa tomorrow. And Montreal should be seeing sunny skies as well with a high of 7 degrees. Now in the Atlantic of Canada, we're looking at mainly clear skies. Also bracing for a uh, tropical storm that could become a post-tropical storm by the weekend. I'll tell you more about that as the week uh, progresses towards Saturday. Uh, sunshine in Fredericton, 5 degrees the high. Same thing for Halifax. A lovely 5 degrees expected tomorrow in Charlottetown with a mix of sun and cloud and 2 degrees in the chance of flurries there in St. John's, Newfoundland. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities, providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas and internet while investing back in communities across southern Alberta. Maple Leaf Foods is reporting a third quarter loss of almost $230 million. That compares with a profit of $44.5 million in the same quarter last year. The Toronto-based packaged meats company says the loss came as it took a $190 million one-time non-cash impairment charge related to its plant protein group. Sales in the quarter increased to $1.23 billion. That is up from $1.19 billion a year earlier. 
Officials at Maple Leaf say the increase was driven by higher sales in its meat protein group, partially offset by lower sales in the plant protein group. Adidas has appointed Puma CEO Bjorn Golden as its new chief executive. He will take over in January as the German sportswear brand weathers the fallout from its split with a rapper formerly known as Kanye West after an outcry over the rapper's anti-Semitic comments. Adidas is expected to take a hit of up to 250 million euros this year from the decision. The departure of Kasper Rorsted, who had been the CEO of Adidas since 2016, was announced in August and he is set to leave on Friday. The company's chief financial officer will take over as interim chief executive until the end of the year. German auto supply company Bosch is going to pay $25 million to settle a California lawsuit stemming from the emission scandal that tarred Volkswagen in 2015 and Fiat Chrysler two years later. The state said the two automakers installed defeat devices in around 100,000 diesel passenger vehicles sold in California, which made it seem like they met emissions requirements as they were undergoing testing. But on the road, however, they actually polluted at many times the legal limit. Bosch officials say they neither acknowledge the validity of the claims nor concede any liability whatsoever. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 114 points on the day to finish at 19,660. The Dow was up 333 points to 33,160. The S&P 500 was up 21 on the day to 3828. And the NASDAQ was up 51 points to 10,616. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 288 to 8891 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 81 cents to 614 US. Gold was up 4 cents to 1712.46 US an ounce. And silver was up a cent to 2136 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at 12.79 per bushel. Barley's at 986. Canola's at 2062 and corn is at $12.06 per bushel. Live cattle were unchanged at $153.05. Feeder cattle January contract was up five cents to $178.28, and lean hogs were down $1.48 to $85.58. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $74.47 US. Recapping one of our top stories, in dealing with the cold and snowy weather here in Lethbridge, the city has activated its extreme temperature response plan to provide a safe and warm place for those who do not have shelter. That includes access to both the main branch of the public library and crossings branch. City officials say the regional park and ride transit terminal can also offer a warm, safe place Monday through Friday until midnight. Officials say other places to seek warm shelter include the YWCA Harbor House, the Alpha House, Streets Alive Mission, and the Lethbridge Soup Kitchen. Finance Minister Christian Freeland says to help with the high cost of living, Canadians should really cancel their Disney Plus subscriptions. Now, some view that as a slap in the face, including political commentator Brian Lilly, who will explain why shortly. And just a reminder, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. In order to help Canadians with their bills and the high cost of living, Finance Minister Christa Freeland is recommending that we cancel our Disney Plus subscription like she did with her family to save money. To talk about this in more detail is political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly who joins us from Toronto. Brian, many would view that piece of advice as kind of a slap in the face to Canadians. How about maybe not increasing the carbon tax or maybe not taking as much off of our paychecks? They're going to be increasing, uh, as of January 1st, your CPP and EI premiums. Those are two payroll taxes. And yes, they are payroll taxes. Your employer has to pay them as well, and they don't get the benefit of EI or a pension at the end of it. Uh, they're going to be increasing on April 1st the carbon tax. They're going to be increasing the annual tax on beer and wine and, and other spirits. They're, they, they're bringing in new taxes in this fall economic statement that came up out last week. But worse than that, Hal, Chrystia Freeland made that out of touch comment about Disney Plus while saying that, you know, I just like all the mothers out there have to look after their family budget. I'm doing that with Canadians. And that's why she said she's canceled Disney Plus. Find little bits of savings. Where are the savings in the federal spending? The fall economic statement increased spending from last April's budget by $20 billion for the current fiscal year. $20 billion between April and November. What are we spending the money on? 
This is not COVID relief programs. Those have all been wound down. Overall spending is up more than a third since the pre-pandemic days. And as I said, we're not doing the COVID spending anymore. We've got deficits going out of control and that means higher debt. Right now that means higher interest rates. Our debt payments, the servicing the debt, this is just paying the interest, not even paying a penny of the debt down. It was supposed to be 26.9 billion this year. That's what they said in the uh, April budget. Now they say it'll be 34.7. Next year, it'd be 43 billion. Wow. We're spending more on servicing the debt than we are on our military, the Canada Child Benefit, than we are on EI. And we're spending almost as much as we spend on the health transfer from the federal government to the provinces. Don't tell me about canceling Disney Plus when you're spending on everything else is going through the roof. Christy Freeland is out of touch on this one. It, you know, she did admit later that she's very privileged. But she didn't add that she's also out of touch. Besides, Disney Plus has all of the Marvel movies. We can't cancel that, Brian. <laughs> exactly. Brian, the Emergencies Act inquiry continues in our nation's capital. Now, before we get to the latest evidence, one high-profile person will not be attending, and that's Ontario Premier Doug Ford. He won his court challenge to quash the summons. Brian, wasn't the Premier's testimony relevant for this inquiry? You could argue about that. I would say it would be interesting to the inquiry, but I don't think it's relevant to the central question, which is why did the federal government invoke the Emergencies Act? That's the fundamental question that this inquiry has to answer. Doug Ford's position is this was a policing matter and it's a federal inquiry called into the invocation of a federal law. Now, can you imagine the outcry if Danielle Smith or Scott Moe or Doug Ford decided they were going to call an inquiry into the handling of COVID-19. And then as part of that, decided to issue a summons for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau so that he could be interrogated as to uh, the government's decision not to put in restrictions or screening at airports, the government's handling of the vaccine. Uh, they, they would not only refuse to comply with it, they would be scoffed at. Oh, you, you can't have one level of government calling the other. So Ford went to court. He said that it was parliamentary privilege, and he won on that. The, the Ontario legislature is sitting right now. It's in session. It's not sitting this week. But Ford is pretty darn busy with the school strike and everything else that we might talk about later on. So, yeah, he uh, the judge found whether you believe Ford should appear or not, the judge made the right decision based on law. Now, we've heard from top police officials who did not think that the Emergencies Act was needed. But this week, we heard from another witness who said, you know what, it was absolutely necessary. So who do we believe? Who was right? Well, I, so far, I'm going to go with the, the top police and intelligence officials who were saying, no, don't do this. Uh, Windsor Mayor Drew Dilkins looking at it from a very personal, practical and political lens. You know, his city is the gateway to Canada in terms of trade. It's the busiest border crossing in North America in terms of two-way trade. And the bridge was shut down for a week. Never should have happened. Never should have gone on as long as it did. But it was cleared before the Emergencies Act was invoked. Now, Ontario invoked its own Emergencies Act or version of it. I forget the official name. It's far less draconian, far less sweeping powers. It doesn't go nearly as far as the federal government. It just gave police a few more powers to clear the bridge, which they did a full day and a half, two days before uh, Justin Trudeau invoked the Emergencies Act. So I understand where Mayor, Mayor Dilkins is coming from. He was looking at it saying, all these factories are going to shut down. Uh, and when you think of something like the auto industry, where parts will go back and forth across the border seven times before a car is complete, um, and it's all just in time delivery, you were looking at thousands upon thousands of people being laid off by that bridge being shut down if it continued. So I get it from an economic angle. I don't think he's right on the need to invoke the Emergencies Act, though. Brian, one document that came up in testimony this week showed that CSIS warned the Trudeau Liberals that invoking the Emergencies Act could anger a number of Canadians further and potentially radicalize some. Why then did the feds move forward with invoking the act? Well, they, look, they didn't listen to CSIS and they didn't listen to the RCMP. RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky um, told them that we haven't used all the tools we need. And now we find, and they still went ahead. Now we find out that CSIS told them this will radicalize people 
and they still went ahead. The concern from CISAs wasn't that there would be violence right away, um, but that by invoking the act, people who are angry at government and decided that this protest was a, a good way of expressing that might turn around and then say, well, I have no other option now. I've got to turn to violence because if I protest, they just shut me down. That was part of the thinking from CSIS. They warned the government about this both before and after the Emergencies Act was invoked. That warning seems to have been ignored. It'll be really interesting to find out more when David Viano, the head of CSIS, testifies, and I think that's going to happen next week. Brian, school strikes don't usually make national news headlines, but this past week that changed as Ontario used the notwithstanding clause to try and end the strike, and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau launched attacks on Ontario Premier Doug Ford for suspending charter rights. Now, wait a minute. Didn't our Prime Minister do something similar when he invoked the Emergencies Act during the Freedom Convoy? I would argue that, yes, he did. Uh, you know, the Liberals keep saying that um, charter rights weren't suspended by invoking the Emergencies Act. That was the entire point. They uh, suspended rights for uh, peaceful assembly. They suspended rights on travel. They suspended uh, uh, all kinds of rights, including being able to say to someone, you must provide me a service whether you want to or not. You, you know, the whole thing around tow truck operators. So the Emergencies Act definitely suspended charter rights. But beyond that, Trudeau also suspended charter rights with his mandate that you needed to be vaccinated to get on a plane or a train. That is a violation of Section 6 charter rights. That's the, your mobility rights are enshrined in the charter. You are should be free and able to move around this country. And he stopped that. Uh, he made it very difficult for some people to go across the country. Why? It wasn't based on science. It was based on politics and fear. That was headed towards a court challenge, and the government dropped the requirement for the mandates just before it was going to court, and then went before the judge and said, well, this is all moot now. We don't need to have this. Please throw the case out. The judge ended up saying, yes, there's, there's no mandate in place now, so there's no need to test it. I wish they had said, no, we need to go further and see if it was a, a you know, if the court would find it was a charter rights violation. Um, we didn't get there. But also beyond that, Trudeau comes from Quebec. You know, they've got Bill 96, which strips away language rights for the English speaking minority. There are historically English towns in Quebec where the municipality wants to provide your tax bill, your water bill, what have you in English. They always have. There's no issue locally. But the province has gone in and said, you can't do that anymore. Trudeau has been mute on that. He's expressed a concern now and again, but he didn't launch a week-long campaign. Same with Bill 21, which says if you wear a, a cross, a star of David, a yarmulke, a hijab to work and you're a public servant, that you're going to be removed from your job. And one teacher was removed from the classroom. He never went on a week-long campaign. So Trudeau is an absolute hypocrite on this, and I hope people see it for what it is. Um, you know, it, Quebec can invoke the notwithstanding clause all the time and far greater matters of importance and, and Trudeau's silence. And, but he, he's angry at Doug Ford. It makes no sense. You know, Brian, so many families we chatted with were crushed with the fact that they couldn't go see other family members who were dying in other parts of Canada. They couldn't fly. They couldn't take the train, like you said. So, yeah, it devastated a number of families here across the country. Now, speaking of health, provincial health ministers are meeting with their federal counterpart in British Columbia. All the province want... All the provinces are actually asking for is an increase in health funding. Do you think they'll receive it? Um, partly, but not what they want and not for the reason that they want. They're going to get an automatic increase because of the formula the way it is now. Um, when there's in inflation, it's tied to inflation. And so because inflation's so high this year, they're going to get a one-time bump up. But when inflation goes back down, that disappears. So this is not the permanent steady funding that premiers have been asking for. And, you know, it was interesting to see Adrian Dix, the B.C. health minister, out at the conference saying the prime minister's not a potted plant. He's got to show up and actually talk to the provinces, which he's refused to do. You know, he, he talked a big game coming into uh, office in 2015. He's never followed through on it in terms of respecting provinces the way he promised he would. He didn't overturn Harper's funding formula that he called a health care cut. He's kept it in place, and he has refused to negotiate any further increases. So they're going to get a, a one-time bump due to inflation, but they're not going to get what they say they, they need.
They don't want the federal government to go back up to 50%, by the way, but they are asking for 30, 35% funding instead of the 21, 22% that they provide now. What the federal government wants to do is call the shots and not pay the bill. And that's unacceptable to, to the provinces. Brian, the United Nations Climate Change Conference is getting underway fairly soon. It runs November 6th through the 18th. Many dignitaries will be flying with their jumbo jets into Egypt, polluting the atmosphere, including Edmonton Mayor Sohi. And Brian, the event will be held at a luxury beach resort, the best your tax dollars can buy. You know, I've, I've been trying to find out will there be a $6,000 a night room, Hal? Don't know yet. Uh, time will tell. We're going to have to wait for the uh, access to information requests to come back on this one. I have asked Environment and Climate Change Minister Stephen Guibault, or through his office, I've asked, where are you staying? They won't say. How many people are you taking? They won't say. But we know Canada, historically, under the Trudeau government, has had one of the largest delegations. We're not the largest country by population. We're not close. We're not the largest country by uh, carbon emissions. Not close. But, you know, last year it was just shy of 300 people in Glasgow. In Paris, their first year, it was 300 people. In, in Spain, which was a smaller conference, I think we were still second. You know, we're regularly triple the UK's um, uh, delegation count and double the Americans. How on earth does that make sense? It doesn't. But they are going to be saying at the Sharm El Sheikh, look it up if you haven't seen it. Um, I'll have a video posted out soon showing some of the beautiful spots. You can uh, you can still get rooms, but they're going to be pretty pricey. So I'm, I'm guessing you know twenty five hundred dollars a night for the hotel rooms at some of these beach resorts. And, oh, and by the way, it's being held at the uh, the Lamborghini Convention Center. That sounds very affordable, Lamborghini. Absolutely, <laughs> and, a Ferrari to Lamborghini. Look, it's a car maker. Yeah, that's right. Brian, what's the latest with uh, Canada's support for Ukraine right now? I mean, we've given a lot of money when it comes to humanitarian aid, some military supplies. And some people are saying, you know, Canada is being stretched too thin and we don't have any more to give. What are you hearing? Well, I know that there's a push on to try and get uh, some of the money that uh, Canada seized from Russia and just hand those Russian funds over to the Ukraine. This gentleman named Bill Browder, who's been at the forefront of this fight internationally, who's been an enemy of Putin for years. He's the guy behind the Magnitsky Act that allows you to freeze funds that Canada passed, the U.S., the U.K. and uh, Australia and other countries. Um, he was meeting recently with uh, Finance Minister Christy Freeland, and he's been pushing on this. Now, I've been trying to find out exactly how, how much Russian cash we seized. The Russians had left their Canadian uh, uh, dollar uh, foreign exchange funds at the Bank of Canada. So those funds were seized. Other countries have done the same. Around the world, there's more than 300 billion of Russian funds that have been seized by different Western governments that could be handed over to, to Ukraine. So, you know, for all the people worried that we're spending too much to fund the war in Ukraine, there's an easier solution. Give them Vladimir Putin's money. Um, you know, he, uh, he, he doesn't deserve it. He is a, a, a dictator who is profiting off of his own invasion of another country. Give Zelensky Putin's money and uh, things will turn around very quickly. Sounds like a solid solution. Toronto Sun columnist and political reporter Brian Lilly, thanks again for your time today. Thank you. Well, according to Statistics Canada, about two-thirds of Canadians say that they are of Christian faith. However, it's only a relatively small percentage who regularly attend church. So why is that and what are they missing out on? Our guest today is Gary Mason. He is a pastor at Medicine Hat Family Church. Welcome to Bridge City News, Pastor Gary. Great to have you on. Awesome. Thanks for having me. No problem. So, Pastor Gary, why is it that so many Christians are choosing not to attend church these days? Uh, you know, I think there's probably a, a multitude of reasons why people decide that. I think probably the largest is they don't understand the value of it. When we, I mean, you look all the way back in the book of Genesis, you see God makes this statement about Adam and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. Now I know that's in particular talking about marriage and all of those things, but the principle still holds true that it's, 
we do better when we're in relationship. We were created for relationship. And, and if you don't understand that and you don't understand the value of it, then you're probably not going to make the priority to go to it. Mm, yeah, that's a very good point. So do you ever hear comments like, oh, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian or, you know, some people might say that church is boring or I hate going to church. Yeah, sir. Sure. Sir, sure, I do. I, I think that it's probably, I mean, it's a true statement to be able to say, I don't have to go to church mm -hmm. in order to be a Christian. That's, that's a true statement, but it's not the whole truth. There's more to it than that, that, you know, in order to be a strong Christian, in order to walk in all that God has for us, we need to, uh, we need to be in relationship and we need to be together in the body of Christ. Some would say, well, I am the church, but the reality is, is that very word church uh, it comes from an old Greek word called the ecclesia, and the ecclesia was the called out and gathered together people. They were called out of their communities, out of their homes and everything, and they were gathered together for a purpose. And, and when we look at that, you know, it was specifically used by the Apostle Paul a lot of times to, to say, hey, we are called out. We need to come together for the purposes of the kingdom of God. And if we miss that, then we miss something in the middle of it all. So, so you know, I don't have to go to church. Mm, that's maybe the truth, but you're better off if you do. Mm -hmm. Good point there. I know a lot of people, I've been guilty of this myself, saying that uh, you can fellowship with God just as easily when you're hiking in the mountains or, you know, kind of out in nature, uh, that type of thing. And of course, with the COVID pandemic too, and the prevalence of online churches. So now we've got people saying that you can get the same benefits by watching a church online. So would you agree with that? <laughs> uh, well, I want to say, first of all, I'm thankful for online church for the times that people can't make it. That's great. And, and there is value in that. And so if you can't make it, then get the online experience. But, uh, you know, I think you should when you're hiking in the mountains, you should, you know, commune with the Lord. You should be communing with the Lord no matter what you're doing, driving down the street, going for coffee. And you're at work. Whatever it is we're doing, we should be in constant communication with the Lord. That's why Paul said, you know, praying always with all prayers. So we're supposed to be in a constant state of communing with the Lord. But that communing with the Lord that you'll find when you're hiking in the mountains is different than you get in a corporate setting. So yes, you can experience the Lord there, but no, you won't experience him the same way as you can in a corporate setting. It's a different thing. So you're not comparing apples to apples when you make those statements. And, and I get it. I mean, sometimes church can be boring. I'm a preacher and uh, hey, I've been there myself. But the, but the reality is, is that not everything that is good for me is necessarily exciting. You know, I, I like to go out for pizza, uh, you know, and, and ice cream and those kind of things. And those are fun. But sometimes, you know, in order to be healthy, I've got to go home and I've got to eat my oatmeal. As they used to say when you were a kid, your mom always eat your oatmeal, you know, like because there's some things that are good for you that they're not always exciting, but they're still good for you. And you still need to maintain those things. Some people love to exercise. Other people don't. But exercise is still good for you. So in the same way, church, it's good for you. Well, as long as you don't find your own sermons boring, <laughs> that would, then we'd be in trouble, right? But okay, so yeah. you're, you're mentioning a lot of the benefits here, and you mentioned pizza and ice cream, and of course, it brought to mind the friendships that you can make uh, just by attending oh, yeah. in person as well, and oftentimes uh, we find ourselves uh, going out afterwards, going out for lunch or whatnot, and that is definitely a, a, one of the fun aspects of it. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, those relationships are ones that will carry us through a lot of difficult times. I, you know, uh, just a little more than a year ago, I lost my my own father. He he passed away, and and that's. But it was the you know church. It was important in in bringing healing and all of those things with that. But what really carried me through those times was the friendships and the close relationships that I had with people. And so those are things that develop as you come and spend time together. You don't get that kind of relationship without 
time. You got to, I mean, there's the old saying that relationship is spelled T-I-M-E. And so whether it be in a church setting or a Bible study setting or fellowship after service or whatever it is, those times that we spend together, knit our hearts together. And when we need someone, then I can, I find that those are the relationships that we lean on. And, and so it's important because nothing really brings Christians together like prayer and worship and being under the word. There's something about that spiritual thing that happens between us that knits our hearts together so that we can be there for each other when we need it. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your father. That's very sad. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, I've heard people also talk about they can't get along with certain people or also they can't find a church that they 100% agree with. And that that's also a very common one too. Yeah, I've been pastoring for a lot of years, and I don't know if there's ever been a church that I 100% <laughs> agree with. <laughs> it's, it's because we have more than one person in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have different people in the room, you're going to have people that, you know, we have different viewpoints of different things and everything. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't get together. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't come together. Just uh, from that end, let me, I, if I can, I, I've got a, a New Testament here. It's by N.T. Wright. And I just want to read a couple of verses here. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 23, it says, Let us hold on tightly to our confession of hope. Without being diverted, the one who announced the message to us is trustworthy. Let us uh, as well stir up one another's minds to energetic effort in love and good works. And this is one of the points of coming together is that we need to stir each other up. He goes on to say, we mustn't do what some people have gotten into the habit of doing, neglecting to meet together. Instead, we must encourage one another and all the more as you can see the great day coming. And, and when we think about that, I can't encourage people unless I'm in the room with them. I can't encourage people if I don't have a relationship with them. The other side of that is, is we're all made better by relationships. I think that, you know, um, Sometimes people rub me the wrong way. It's kind of like sandpaper. But one of the things about rubbing with sandpaper yeah. is it polishes, right? The Bible says it this way, that there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors and that iron sharpens iron. And so when we think about that, you know, we just get, we, we are made better through those relationships. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it's all about. It's about relationship building, isn't it? Part of that, I would imagine, is uh, the importance of accountability and even correction in our daily spiritual walk. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, the book of Hebrews tells us that uh, we should obey those that have the rule over us and and do it to the point where they can do it with joy. In other words, I'm I'm accountable to somebody. Somebody somewhere is helping me along the way. Uh, David said in Psalms 23 uh, that the rod and the staff, they comfort him. You know, that rod and that staff, they talk about protection for sure, but they also talk about correction. I always think like, like this, that if I'm wrong, I want someone to correct me. So, Lord, would you correct me? Would you put people in my life that will help me to, to correct me? And that's not always fun certainly not always fun but the fact of the matter is if i don't get corrected i'm still wrong and i don't want to be wrong <laughs> so so lord help me and i think yeah. you're also talking about counsel too right like coming together and being counseled by others that you kind of uh, look up to or sure. maybe spiritual leaders as well so absolutely yeah, so yeah, many yeah. benefits Paul talked about submitting one to another. And again, you can't submit one to another unless you're together in the room. And 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 really everywhere you see in the New Testament that the gospel went forward, what happened? Churches were established. People came together. It's how we help each other so that we can all walk with the Lord stronger, better become, uh, you know, healing comes in those areas. Uh, deliverance and and strength and the peace of God, knowing that I'm not the only guy going through this. Other people mm -hmm. are going through this too, mm -hmm. and, and walking together is so so important for us as believers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just 
you know, need somebody to talk to or somebody to take you out for a cup of coffee or, uh, you know, uh, people in the hospital. They, they get those visits by people of the church as well. So there are. And, you know, as a minister, I get to do hospital visitation, uh, you know, from time to time. And, and I can tell you that it's a whole lot easier when I know them ahead of time. I, I mean, I can do it if I've never met them before, but if you have an ongoing relationship, it's easier to walk in and to help people process different things that they're going through in the time. And so that relationship pays off dividends long after uh, it's established. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. Okay, here's a good one. Do we bring our kids to church or do you leave it up to them? So, for example, like a lot of parents miss church for their kids' sporting events, right? That this is a reality, obviously. Um, but is it necessarily a good thing? And, it, you know, how do we how do we maneuver through that? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And as a father of four boys who are, I mean, they're mostly grown now, but but at the at as we were, uh, you know, working with our children, raising them and everything, I was always reminded of Genesis chapter 18, where it speaks about Abraham. And it says that God chose him because he would command his children and his household after him, which is really interesting when you begin to look at it. He, he not only told them what to do, but he showed them with his very life. And, and he didn't just say, go to church. He said, come to church and when and the implication is is that when he went to church with them if if there was a church back then obviously there there wouldn't have been back in in abraham's time but but when he went to worship the lord he would say come with me and he would demonstrate to them what that meant they would see him worship the lord then he would actively show them uh you know the the whole from his own heart that he believed God, that he trusted the Lord. And, and so that was, it, it says that I have chosen him because of this, because he will raise a godly seed after him. And I'm paraphrasing there a bit, but that's, that's an important point for us as parents to realize is that, that God is looking for someone who would raise a godly seed after them. That's part of our role as parents. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do church leaders need to be aware of things that the church needs to improve on to make attendance more attractive? Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, for sure, there's a reality to which we have to work at that. There's an old saying amongst preachers that the ear can only handle what the butt can endure. And talking about, you know, if, if I get sore and I'm tired and, and everything, it's hard to hear what I'm listening to. And so I think there's a reality to that. At the same time, as a as someone who sits in a pew at times, I've got to stop and I've got to realize that it's not just all about my comfort. So there's this balance that, and I suppose, a tension between those who are leading and those who are listening and, and how we help both of us, you know, and so. So I think we should make sure that we can make it comfortable and we can do all those things. I should turn the heat on in the wintertime and, and all <laughs> of those things. That's a good things. idea. But, <laughs> but especially today. But, yeah. but the reality is, is that it's not necessarily all about me. And mm -hmm. so I will probably have to understand that sometimes I have to give, uh, give some leeway in that as well. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, so what can we do to make church more inviting? <laughs> invite people. <laughs> I think I think the one of the things we have to remember is that church should be about relationship. And so when we invite people and we open our hearts to them and and we make church inviting by inviting people not just through the doors but once they're in we invite them into our community. You know, it's that's what people are looking for. They're not just looking for a place to go and be taught because you can go online and get taught. You can hear a message, but you can't get that face to face personal relationship. And so the way that we make it inviting is by by being inviting as a people, as a as those who are there. And so allowing people in. Don't be clicky. Let people in. Oh, that's major, isn't it? Thanks so much for being with us today, Pastor Gary. Appreciate you. It's been my pleasure. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Gary Mason is the pastor of Medicine Hat Family Church. So glad to have him on today. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks for watching.